and welcome to the uh, 16th episode of the Dr. Tech Show. Uh, we're pre-recording this on the 2nd of uh, September um, because we have to. So, uh, But we're delighted to be joined by our special guest today, Bobby Robson, um, who we'll hear about more in a minute. Um, unfortunately, John Popham is unable to join us for this show, but Swain and I will do our best to guide you to the world of online communications. We're not expecting him, but if John does pop in, that would be a bo always a bonus. So as usual, we talk about the weather as first. And so Swain, where, how's the weather where you are? Lustery, overcast, rain. Next question. <laughs> <laughs> well, the same here in Le Hinch, where I still am. And it's, uh, it was raining hard this morning, and now it's just kind of raining softly, gently, making the grass very green outside my window. Um, how's the weather where you are, Bobby? It was really, really sunny earlier, but the, yeah, it's starting to, to cloud over and the clouds are getting darker. So I think I'm getting all of that rain from the West. <laughs> <laughs> there we go. Um, so as usual, we um, have an awareness slot. And uh, for this week's show on Thursday, the 10th of September, it's World Suicide Prevention Day. Um, and according to the information we've got, in the UK, men are three times as likely to die by suicide than women. And in the Republic of Ireland, the rate is four times higher among men than women. While there has been a reduction in the number of people completing uh, suicide over the last 10 years, the numbers are still worryingly high. So World Suicide Prevention Day aims to start the conversation about suicide and to show that recovery is possible. And every year uh, for this day, there's a theme. And this year, the theme is working together to prevent suicide. So we have some numbers for uh, organizations that can help people if they um, have suicidal thoughts or want to help other people who might, they might be concerned about. So the Samaritans, their number is 116123 and that's free for most UK phones or you can email joe, J-O, at samaritans.org. The uh, Papyrus organization who I know of I've used in the past because I was concerned about a, uh, somebody. Um, they work with people under 35 who are having suicidal feelings and with people who are worried about someone under 35. And their telephone number is 0800 068 4141. That's 0800 068 4141. And if you want to email them, it's pat, P A T, at papyrus, P A P Y R U S hyphen UK dot org. And finally, we have Silver Line, which is aimed at people over 55, and their helpline is open 24 hours a day, every day of the year. Telephone number 0800 74, sorry, start again. Telephone number 0800 470 8090. That's 0800 470 80 And so we'll um, move on to the rest of the show. As you say, we're pre recording it um, because we have to, but we are very delighted to be joined today by Bobby Robson from Be More Digital. Bobby supports mainly small charities, uh, that is uh, organizations with incomes of much less than a million pounds. And they do great work to support beneficiaries in their communities to make the most of technology and digital product techniques. Bobby helps them improve access to support for the beneficiaries and or their supporter and donor purposes to increase retention and supportive value. And Bobby's also a digital and communications trustee at To Make It. Bobby, welcome to the show. Thank you for having me. So how are things with you these days and what's happening in your world? Yeah, it's getting it's getting pretty busy. I um, made my, my first sale not long ago for um, Be More Digital's first course, first online training course, which um, teaches the key concepts of digital working. Um, so it's, it's kind of a little different to trust online communication so it it teaches the um the theory in a practical way um so i did my testing earlier in the summer um got some great responses um it's a six week uh, course um, where we have one hour sessions um and just chat kind of like this and um go around and talk about how they might put it into practice with what they're doing um and before that, every session they get um, a load of reading material and a few exercises to do each week. Um, so yeah. So um, what's your what's it, your sorry, Bobby? What's your background in in all this work? Where 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 did you start off? <laughs> I started off um, in art. I um, did a art degree and wanted to go into community arts, um, and then through that first kind of place where I was part 
time paid part-time volunteer um, at a little space called the Create Place in Bethnal Green um, on Old Ford Road. I think it's still open actually. I walked past it the other day. Um, and we, we just created some a space for the community to come and make things. Um, but part of that was about telling people about it. So I got really into websites, uh, blogging, uh, social media at the time. I mean, this was over 10 years ago now, well, about 10 years ago now. Um, so, and I've been doing that pretty much ever since, really. Mm. So what, what enthuses you about the world of online communications? I think it's the ability to be able to reach out from a room like this. <laughs> you know, I'm, right now I'm talking to, to you in Ireland and Swain up in Scotland um, and people watching it from wherever they are. And it's just the ability to be able to reach out and have conversations with people um, and try to empower people as well. It's the empowerment that I think it could bring to, especially small organisations, to reach well beyond their means um, to make that real impact. Mm -hmm. So um, what kind of um, people have you met along in your journey along the way? I mean, along the way, I've met some some people who have been very, very negative about online communications um, and managed to bring them around um, mm -hmm. by, you know, there's, I always find a gently, gently approach works. So, you know, just trying to suggest that maybe rather than creating another PDF, it could be a few questions on a form that would help someone um, answer the questions or answer the problem that they have. Um, right now with um to make it there's a bit of a discussion about twitter and how how as an organization it's used because um to make it's a um prisoner rehabilitation charity so there's a lot of security um and rightly there's a lot of risk considerations that we need to make when we use twitter um so i'm kind of slowly mentoring and coaching the chief exec because it's, it's only one it's a one one person band for, that's running this charity as most small charities are um so it's about kind of empowering him to to have the confidence to be able to share what they've been doing because they've been doing some incredible stuff during lockdown um to make sure that people in prisons who right now are more than 23 hours a day in their cells are actually being able to have some activities to do um, especially when we're not able to go in and do that work. Mm, I have heard, I've got other other friends who uh, work in the criminal justice system and they are very concerned about what's happening in prisons right now um, yeah. and, and about the families of, of people in prisons because they are often get neglected in this equation. Um, so yeah, I, I'm, you know, we're, and we have talked about it briefly on the show, I think previously, about yeah. what happens um so how are you to be to be fair it's 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 always an issue for offenders who are um imprisoned from the scottish islands or even the highlands uh they're always at least hundreds of miles and sometimes a ferry trip away from any possible visits from family and friends so um the, the, there's a huge there's a huge um need for remote or distance communications for, yeah. for, for inmates i think Mm. Yeah, it's it's very difficult, especially especially now when you don't have any education programs because they're generally provided by people that aren't employed by the prison, so they're they're third party suppliers that will come in and you know run an art class, run a music class, and um, do some IT training as well, some skills training just to get get people who are in prison to be given the opportunity for when they come out to actually be able to work in the real world yeah. mm -hmm. um because if you're not giving them the skills then how how are we meant to help them rehabilitate and um, yeah something that i've yeah. always been quite passionate about <laughs> it's it seems like the the very pointy end of digital exclusion you know somebody people who are who are locked up and who have no um means of um you know uh using technology would be even more and, and, and kind of no prospect maybe of, of using it either. So, yeah. So we've got on yeah. the screen now um, a link to the To Make It website. Yeah. Hope that yeah. shows reasonably well since we're not broadcasting on YouTube. We're recording today. So, but I, I get, I, I think you should be able to see that on the screen. Except, of course, if you're listening on Hope Radio. Uh, 
in which case um, we're sharing the screen of to make it, numeral to make it dot org. Mm. So is this something, have you had anything to do with the website, Bobby? Um, no, the website was created before I joined as a trustee. Um, however, the, there is, it hasn't been updated since. <laughs> so I'm currently creating a, a how-to guide um, for how to add news items um, to it at the very, very least. Um, and then looking at next, next step will be images. Um, right. there's, been, there's a great partnership with uh, a social enterprise. Um, which is a project called Made Visible, which happened last year. And um, it was in one prison. And essentially it was an art project in collaboration with one prison and a job centre and the probation service. And it just kind of showed the, the variety of artworks that were, were being made from, from kind of visual artworks to poem, poetry and, and creative writing. And that's going online this year. Um, and he's actually, because of that, been able to get more more prisons involved and more organisations involved as well. So there's, there's some positives in a way. Um, mm. The reach has definitely improved. Yeah, that's really good. I mean, and that's a, this is a classic story for smaller charities, isn't it? That they have a website or so, somebody, you know, offers to do something for them, but there is no follow through. They don't have the, they don't, they, they can't afford to pay an organization to, you know, keep exactly. it up or they don't have the skills themselves. Yeah. And the website sometimes gets left. And when, when in fact now more than ever, it's needed to be that shop front for the organization. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. 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 I'm sure you've seen that as well, Swain, with people who set up websites and then kind of, um, they don't, they don't get maintained. The, the budget for maintaining them isn't written into the, Really sure, yes, it's, it's, the... it's, it's, it's always, always the same issue, isn't it? That mm. uh, maintenance and, and ongoing support isn't necessarily funded. Mm. Yeah, I mean, I've, I've seen it in, in organisations that have much bigger budgets than, <laughs> than the organisations that we're speaking about as well. So I think it's, it's definitely some education necessary around that as well. Yeah, I remember when um, when lockdown first started, Chris Wells, who's someone else that Bobby and I know, um, and I and um, Tom Walker, I think, got together to um, put together a bit of a Miro board, a, a flow chart for what um, small charities should be doing at the at the start of COVID, because some of them didn't have um, didn't have uh, um, uh, on the homepage where to find information about what was going on, and of course when people go to the websites now they expect to see the, the, the most important pe uh, information on the, on the homepage, not to have to scroll through the menu to, to find what they're looking for. I think that's, I think, you know, um, charities have generally upped their game since the beginning of lockdown, but it's, you know, it was, it, it took a while, I think, for some of them. It's been a very steep learning curve, so. Mm, absolutely. So you were saying about um, the CEO on Twitter. So um, what kind of, you know, you know, what kind of advice are you giving to people to, who are getting started? What's your experience of getting started yourself and what do you advise so the, people? The, the biggest thing that I always say is start having a conversation because um, I try and there's always that, that kind of, oh, it's online, it's different. So I try and put Twitter as like a networking room and you can choose those different areas in that room and those people that you might want to speak to. And then you don't just go over there and shout, I'm from this charity and this is what I do. You involve and engage yourself in a conversation and it should be the same. You know, we're, it's still human beings that are consuming. It doesn't matter whether it's a, a written tweet or if it's a conversation. You, that's, that's the way that people engage and that's the way that people expect to be spoken to. And I think at the start of Twitter, it was very much, I've had an egg sandwich today and let's just broadcast it. But it has matured and people's expectations of the conversation and the quality of what they get has matured with it. Um, so that's the, the main one I do. But it's also about um, finding that kind of balance between sharing what you've been doing, but not sharing too much. Because that's the other concern, because um, to make it, I've been doing so many so many different projects to make sure that there are activities in prisons one is a songwriting project and when we got the first five prisons signed up and some feedback 
I suggested a few a tweet um but it wasn't it was a bit too early to <laughs> suggest that kind of thing on their journey I think mm. so and, and um as you say the CEO is a, is a one-person band yeah. um how do you how do you advise people about fitting in social media you know on the list of things they have to do in, a, in an average one day of, a week. One of the trustees actually manages a Twitter account. <laughs> so sure, um, she's the one that does most of the um, volunteering in there. So she runs in a non-lockdown world. She runs a choir at Rochester Prison and a few other activities. So she's the one that's kind of doing a lot of the delivery. Um, so she decided that she was going to start a Twitter account and share that. Um, so I've been kind of supporting her, but as she becomes more busy doing other things, it's about how do we, how do we find this, this gap? Um, mm. But one of the main things that I've been supporting them with is, is taking advantage of the time of delivering in a different way and trying to look at move, moving away from grant spreadsheets and onto a free customer relationship management system so that they know when who they've applied to when the next call might be what they said because also the as trustees we're getting involved in doing quite a lot of the the writing ourselves for the for the low level bids um so that the chief exec can concentrate on the things that actually matter mm. and this again this conversation with crms is something we've been having in in the tech for good world uh, yeah. Bobby as you know and so kind of what's your latest um, thinking about CRMs and the usefulness of, to them of, of uh, useful to small charities of CRMs what would you so say? We, I'm starting with the fundraising need um, because with with to make it the the service users that we don't have contact details for them and quite often when they leave prison we may lose contact with them. Some, we're starting to work more with probation as well. So that, that does change, but it's about getting it to, I first off started with the spreadsheet um, to try and work out what information would be more useful. And we sat down with the trustees and, and did that and then turned that into fields in the CRM. And then from there we can just, we're just doing it step by step and taking a really iterative process, but we're using a, a free to use system um hubspot that will just allow us to have that one person on there so philip has a view of what's going on and we just cc the the hubspot email address in so that he knows what we've sent mm. great yeah i mean when i when i was um running a session for net squared on uh various tech for good things uh getting a crm uh, was the most popular session that people signed up for. So it's, you know, it's yeah. obviously, uh, and this was like at least two years ago, probably now. So I think, you know, the interest is even more. And I know I've been asked to look at CRMs for other organizations as well more recently. Um, I think it was one of those things that bigger organizations kind of, again, take for granted because they have the resources to put into it. But small organizations, you know, if you were lucky, they had a, a spreadsheet and a, an access database somewhere. Yeah. Or, or multiples of that yeah um I mean, whereas the crm obviously <laughs> yeah I've, 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 worked, I've worked in a few mixed large charities and you know you've got a, a razor's edge fundraising database and then a salesforce database for all the service users and there's no connection between the two so you don't know if you're asking someone that's used your service by sending them an email for a donation mm. which dependent on what you do yeah is a huge risk it's not that's not something i've ever even considered i mean i'm not really involved other than as a the most lowest level volunteer or 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 donor to, uh, with, with many charities um it hadn't occurred to me that crms would be a good idea but obviously it's it's completely the thing mm. yeah it's definitely moved on from websites and onto crms i think <laughs> <laughs> yeah it's, yeah, it's the next step up, isn't it? Yeah. Um, I know when um, when I first started on LinkedIn and when I was teaching people how to use LinkedIn better, uh, there was a time when you could um, tag your contacts on LinkedIn, you know, how you met them and stuff like that. And so it was like a personal CRM. 
Um, but they don't allow that anymore, so it has become less useful. But you know, but during lockdown again, it's become more useful because yeah. more people are have are spending time online and finding finding it handy to to find other people who are who have similar interests or they have other things they want to find out. Yeah. Um, Swain was just showing us the hotspot, uh, the, uh, the HubSpot um, website. There, it's that's a relatively new CRM system, isn't it? It's it's one of the newer ones. That, yeah, they started the off more as a, a marketing and sales platform, um, but they do have quite a lot of functionality that can be adapted to work mm. quite well. Um, so you can use it to send your your newsletter function and um, manage your GDPR compliance as well as kind of your funding bids and, and all of that kind of stuff. You can you can have multiple lists in it. Um, but it's it's free up to I think two users, but I may be wrong. Uh, they definitely ch they change things during COVID, as most did. <laughs> mm, yeah, yeah, yes. We've had um, lots of conversations on here about things that have changed during COVID. Um, we started off in, in the early programs talking about um, different devices like the por portal, Facebook portal. Um, and we had even we talked about it again last week. It seems to come up regularly in our conversations. Um, Amazon and other suppliers are currently uh, making um, portal available at thirty percent off. So it's you know they're really trying to encourage people to yeah. to have that kind of device. So have you have you bought any new devices um, since lockdown, Bobby? We had a story about that last week as well. <laughs> oh gosh, um, so as we went into lockdown, my my laptop died. <gasps> um, <laughs> so. <laughs> So yeah, it just it just started freezing all the time, and it just wasn't happy. And obviously, with um, no access to a hardware support, <laughs> I had to um, fork out to get a new one. So actually, what I did was I bought a a, a tower um, that was just I could slot. I was like, I'm not going anywhere. So <laughs> I'll get a tower, and then I can adapt it and improve it and make it bigger if I need to. And it served me really, really well. Um, there's no way I'd be able to, I mean, when I was on the laptop doing a call like this, that would be it for the laptop. Um, but now, yeah, I've got, I've still got all of the stuff that I was working on open. <laughs> yeah. That's great. So you, you're a bit of a, you can help yourself with the, with the tech, around the tech side of things, Bobby. Yeah, yeah. I tend to be quite a good Googler. <laughs> mm -hmm. YouTube, so, yeah. YouTube videos are, are uh, always useful. Exactly. It's, it's, I think the difficult thing is working out what question you need to ask. Yeah. Um, especially when you're, you're trying to do something quite complicated. Um, like the other day I was trying to turn postcodes into longitude and latitude for, for a mapping exercise that I was doing for a project. Um, and I needed that to happen automatically. <laughs> so I was trying to create the, so I went and found a website that turned the postcodes into a list of longitudes and a list of latitudes. And then I needed to join them into one to then use. Um, and I would have been able to do that absolutely fine on Excel, but the commands were different on Google Sheets, which was what I had to build it on. So it was just finding out what the terminology was and then how to use it. Uh, yeah, mm. I, I can work myself around Google. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, it is one of the things I said earlier on to uh, in lockdown to friends uh, of mine, which is, you know, people don't often don't need much except except to know how to search the internet. You know, it's um, all the information you need is usually there somewhere. Um, and this was this was kind of when we were having conversations about people in the kind of tech world who are kind of reinvent, reinventing the wheel often um, by coming up with this product they thought was needed and then trying to find somebody who needed the product um, yeah you know, the, the opposite way around that we that we have talked about um of solving of problem solving um but being able to search the internet is a is a key skill and undervalued and and people think they do know how to search the internet um which is something i find quite frustrating sometimes but so how how would you say you learned how to use the internet are you do you feel yourself a, a, to be a digital native or something um, of that ilk? i'd say hours of frustration <laughs> um there's definitely i was saying to a friend a, a few weeks ago that my first ever boyfriend would be in hysterics if he knew what i did now he was really <laughs> into his website design 
actually tried to set up a kind of domain hosting company um kept talking to me about all of this all of these acronyms that i use on a daily basis now um <laughs> yeah i couldn't i couldn't have been less interested when i was 15. <laughs> And then over time, it, it just came I think it was natural. necessity, because I always found myself being the most digitally capable in whatever organisation. Like, um, when I, even when I started at the Create Place, I was um, on my art course, I'd learned how to build a website, because we had to. It was one of the things we were um, accredited on, is building our own website to show off our artwork. So, because I'd done that, I'd learned a few tricks and then did it for them and then learned how to use analytics because it was kind of interesting. And then I just, I just started geeking out and getting really excited <laughs> about things. My first website, God, that, that, that would make a whole, a whole program swaying. I think if we had people on. Oh, no, I don't about think that. I want to go there. <laughs> <laughs> it's far too long ago. Is yours still out there somewhere in the internet? No, it won't be. It won't be. <laughs> goodness yeah i think my first one was uh to do with my family um and i remember you know kind of excitedly sending links to everybody and and people weren't meh oh. you know oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that's nice <laughs> yeah how about you bobby is yours still still out there somewhere no i don't think it is no it's not no it's not because <laughs> i was just having a panic then <laughs> No, um, because I, I use I reuse the domain, um, to to go freelance actually. Mm. Um, so my initial, um, freelance domain was a .dot net, um, and that was where the art was, and I just recreated it, um, using a, a horrible website builder that I now don't use, but um it was good to work out where I wanted things and what I wanted it to look like and, and all of that kind of stuff. Um, but yeah, no, so that I now, know, I now have full control over my domains and know where they are. <laughs> mm. Speaking of website builders, um, we had a conversation about this recently and I think we need to have a bit more. John was, I had some um, discussions about it. I think he's kind of having, uh, revising his opinions about WordPress. I think he's not as keen now as he as he used to be. I think is that right, Swain? It, I, I think so. I think it, I think it, 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 like everything else, it's become more and more feature rich and therefore more and more complicated. And it's it's really moved on from being a kind of blog platform to being a full blown web design platform. Yeah. Uh, and I think that John was finding it that introducing people to that from cold is less successful than it used to be because it's more complicated. Mm. I don't think we'd progress the conversation enough though no. to say what he did, what he found more no. useful now. I think Wix and Squarespace have certainly um, become competitors in, in the space for kind of starter websites. Bobby, what would you say, Bobby? What's your... Yeah, I mean, I, I tend to do the design side of things on Wix um, just because it's the one that I built my first ever kind of website that actually went live. Um, on um, but I do find that once it gets stuff on it it can become really slow and that's right. when you need to make the the upgrade to WordPress or or something else because some of the features that WordPress now has does really help you with things like site speed and um, yeah. when site speed isn't there then Google won't index you properly and you won't get found in the search and it just becomes far too detrimental um, i'm nodding away here like i know what everybody's talking about but honestly if i have to design a website i tend to draw it on a piece of paper and give it to somebody else because uh, it gets done more quickly that way <laughs> it's not yeah, the worst that's, that's way to do it mm, yeah uh, what about for images and things like that, Bobby? Who, who, who do you rely on for getting images for the, for the work that you do? So some of the, most of the images that I used on the course, I made myself um, just by putting some circles together. <laughs> so I made a, a little character called Finn, and he's he's just a lot of circles placed in like a human kind of form and filled in with different colours um, that are kind of after post-it notes and I made that 
just on the kind of drawing tool on my laptop um, and then went to Canva to make it a bit bigger and, and a better quality image. Um, and then I sent them off to a designer friend who is now doing them an illustrator for me <laughs> to make them even bigger and better. Um, but yeah, it's always a case of, for me, I always do, I'm always a step-by-stepper. Mm. So I never go full on into the final thing because um, it there's always changes that you want to make as you build it. Mm. So um, for the for the course that you're courses that you're offering now to be more digital, what kind of content are people interested in? What what are the questions people are asking? Um, so the the first kind of flagship course is um, key concepts, and that talks about iteration, which is the the step by step process. There's there's two weeks where we cover that because I think that's the most important part of digital theory to kind of get your head around, and it's the biggest change in the way you work as well to to kind of spend some time really really framing the problem then testing whether the problem actually is a problem and that's that's where those products and services that were launched during covid fell down because they happened so quickly they thought of a problem and didn't check to see if anyone else had solved the problem or gone anywhere near solving the problem um which a lot of them had and then just that constant kind of test check create see um cycle so we spend two weeks on that and then we we also look at making how to make data-driven decisions mm. um a lot of the things that i'm um asked when i'm doing my mentoring or, or just conversations with clients is um how do i fix this i know this isn't working but how do i fix it so um data-driven decisions is about creating um essentially a measurement strategy um, to work out what, what it is that you actually want um, and then to put some numbers or, or some idea of, of kind of KPIs um, or key performance indicators that might be attached to that um, and then see where it goes. But also if it isn't going, then to, how to build some tests to work out why it isn't going in the right way. Um, so it might be that you assume that all of the people that are, um, all of your service users need a form to be able to contact their local um, part of your organization. But actually they may just want to pick up the phone. Mm -hmm. And you won't know that until you test it. Um, so it's about how do you create those tests to work out the reasons why things might not be working as well. Um, and we do a lot over on um, user, user-led creation um it's most of the the content in the course has kind of been guided by um the charity digital skills um the code of practice just to keep i don't want to confuse people the code is there and it's it's a really solid piece so why why reinvent the wheel you know mm. yeah yeah i know that um lots of us in the small charity world are are looking at that code and um I think it's not perfect, but it you know it does it offers a framework that what that wasn't there before, um, yeah. which is very helpful. Yeah, I created it so so I started on this journey to to do the training because I was in a medium sized charity and they they were developing a strategy that was based on the code, um, but they had two people in the organisation that kind of understood what it meant and how to put it in place. Um, and actually what they needed was for the rest of the team to to know the how. They, they, they'd already got the why. They knew they needed to do something and why going down a digital route was very important. But the the how to put that in place, the, the, the practicalities behind the theories wasn't there. So, so that was kind of what led me to, to create the course. Mm. And what kind of response have you had from people so far? It's been pretty slow, um, but those that have have taken it have been really positive. Um, but to get people there has been quite slow. But I think that's just a case of timing, to be honest. Mm. You know, there's <laughs> since we went into lockdown, there's a lot of free training. There's mm. a lot of um, other organisations that have been delivering training face to face that are now online. Um, so 
it kind of comes at a time where it looks like I'm jumping on the bandwagon, even though I've been working on it for 18 months. <laughs> um, but yeah, so I guess it's it's now a point of kind of going out there and talking about it a lot, getting people to know me and who I am, because um, I've spent a lot of time doing contracting and popping in and out and doing less of the consultancy side, so less of the, the public speaking. Um, so yeah, just trying to get people to see me and see the course. Mm. And what have people said so far? What have they liked about it? Um, the pra- being able to put it into practice. So week by be- week by week, I set some weekly challenges. So um, we did on the user testing week, we had to, they either had to do a survey or um, an observation. So it depended where they were with, with what they were building, what they were creating. So um, one of them, one of the learners is actually an impact um, does a lot of impact for a, for a small um, voluntary organisation and she trains on impact reporting but what she wanted to find out was how easy some of the surveys that she was creating were to do so then she did an ob- observation piece where she got five different phone calls like this um, and just watched them they shared the screen watched them she they got frustrated with the way she asked certain questions and she learned so much from doing that and she'd never thought of doing that before. Um, and then another person put a, a little survey on their website because they're, they're looking to, to do some redevelopment of it in the future. And the first, the only question they asked was, did you find what you were looking for? Um, and then if they said no, then they asked like, what were you looking for? And then they could look at kind of, they used a, a tool called Hotjar on their website. So they could kind of work out where people were missing where they thought it was obvious to go to so was one question enough in that case enough in the first if the first instance because what they needed at that point was to prove to the state to the key stakeholders higher up in the charity that a new website or at least a a rethink of the structure of the website was necessary so that was the purpose was to see if it actually was or if they just wanted one because it would look nicer um <laughs> and how do you find um getting fund you know when when, you, when people are uh, trying to get funding for projects like this what 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 issues do you, or barriers come up, do you come up against evidence a lot of the time um a lot of the time it's it's about evidence and a lot of the time as well it's about the time to be able to do the evidence amongst all the time of doing their normal day-to-day work um and then trying to kind of prove the case um whether it would be to a funding body or or to a, a supporter who might be able to to pay for a new website or or even if there, there is that money in reserves and it's necessary um it's it's the time to evidence the need um but also the the knowledge of what that need might be and what a website might be able to do beyond mm. a, a nice shot window <laughs> yeah um i noticed ben matthews was asking uh, on twitter uh, a couple of days ago, or maybe late, late last month, about um, funders for social impact projects. Yes. And um, yeah. I'm not sure if you got a list in the end, but... Um, he said, I did notice in another tweet that it was kind of connected, that he said if there wasn't one or he couldn't find one, he was going to make one. That's right. So That's I'm right. eager. <laughs> <laughs> well, I suggested that he contact Ellie at CAST to see if they yeah. had done anything about it yet, because they would be the obvious, uh, one of the obvious places to, 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 to have yeah, a look. Yeah, I know but, yeah. they're doing um, quite a few things over at CAST at the moment, um, and they're kind of, they've accelerated their, the Catalyst plan because it mm. was going to be a couple of years of research and, and COVID kind of catapulted that forward to so they had to do stuff mm-hmm. um, which is really, really great actually they've got some really interesting projects going on at the moment. yes yes i think i think everybody who's anybody in the in the tech for good space has had some contact with them uh certainly during lockdown if not before and yeah, yeah they're they're certainly accelerating as you say the the impact of, uh, of what's happening um swain when you're when you're um uh, considering do you do you get questions about 
projects that people want you to support uh, and do they have to build a case, a business case around that? Yes, we have our own internal, I work for a local authority and we have our own internal processes for all of that sort of thing and uh, including um, signing off the business case by really the most senior people in the organisation before we sit down, go down, devote to me resources or something that may end up being just somebody's bright idea and not of any particular use and we get I mean, I think since we've started to do things more in that way, there's a bit more discipline come come in, and we we do now tend to mostly get good project ideas, and uh, the the more speculative um, cosmetic things that we might have looked looked seen coming along maybe 10, 15 years ago, and it's much less of that now. Everybody seems to know what the system is. Mm, yeah. I was just looking at your website Bobby and I shared it briefly uh, and I noticed, I noticed you have a digital Q&A for charities events. Yes yeah every third Sunday um, every third Sunday <laughs> every third Wednesday of the month so the next one's on the 16th of September um, yeah it's a it's an hour-long session and um, dependent on numbers um, it's well if there's one person you get the full hour <laughs> which happens occasionally um but there's up to 10 spaces um and that that gives you kind of a, a quick question you you give me your question beforehand so i can if there is 10 of us we can go through it quite quickly so i can just say your question was hmm. um and then kind of answer it as quickly as possible so that's aimed at people working in charities who might have questions about digital stuff or people who have digital projects and want to discuss them is that the sort of yeah so i mean it ranges from i'm in the middle of a website project how do i make a decision about this um about having a chat bot on it or having an event plugin mm -hmm. um <laughs> to um the other day it was like how do i start with um kpis because <laughs> they've just been asked to, yeah. to do some digital KPIs. Um, so, you know, we had we had a, well, there was two of them on the call that time. So there was half an hour of chatting about KPIs and what questions she needed to ask of the organisation um, and how she might run any kind of like conversations and what, could she do it in a fun fun way to get that in kind of information as well? So what, what are the, um, so you said some of the questions people are asking. Are you keeping a log, by the way, of the questions people are asking? Because yeah, it sounds so like it could be very useful. I'm, I'm hoping to build um, an, a digital FAQ kind of tool. Um, so I'm, I'm collating all of those. And then once I've had a chance to kind of write up a few tips um, for them, and I'll go online. But I'm also going to create probably a, a form so people can, can ask them and I can build up a bank of digital questions from across the charity sector. And, um, yeah. <laughs> Great. One of the um, stories we had on last week's show was about um, a new platform, uh, a European Union platform um, run by Medici um, called digitalinclusion.eu, where they're looking for stories about projects that, have, um, that are happening around the European um, a union area and I know UK isn't in the European Union anymore but I don't think anybody's going to stop you putting putting stories in um, and it sounds like that would be you know useful and interesting I'm certainly going to keep, be keeping an eye on it to see because yeah. I think storytelling and tell and people hearing about how things have worked for other people uh, is often the you know a great way of people learning and and becoming persuaded that something is is useful and necessary. Yeah, I was just um, on um, one of the many Slack teams that I'm on. There was a question asked today um, about how to, what's the easiest web application to, to build functionality so people can ask a question and it can be created as a PDF and sent. I've just created exactly that. So I was like, here's how I've done it. If you want a bit more information, I'm happy to share it. Because that kind of information isn't retained by me. You no. know, that's just something that if I, well, some of it was Googled because I didn't know how to, um, a PDF generator i have never heard of. Um, I knew you could do it, but I didn't know that there was a tool that, out there that did it. Um, <laughs> Working in a local authority, we certainly know what they are. <laughs> yeah. Um, 
Well, what I was trying to do with this was move people away from a PDF. Yes, quite. <laughs> Inadvertently, I ended up creating another one. Yes. Um, but at least it wasn't a PDF of guidance. It was a PDF that could be used yeah. and taken and kind of, this is, this is why I need your help. This is the evidence kind of thing. Yeah. Mm. Now, that sounds really good. And the kind of thing that uh, lends, would lend itself to a quick blog post and some, something you can refer back to. And this is something I've always... You know, a friend of mine asked me, oh, at least five, six years ago, you know, why don't you blog? And at the time, I wasn't that much bothered. And now I wish I had started then because, you know, every time I learn something new, I should write a post about it because other yeah. people want to know these sort of things as well. And it's great to be able to refer back to, mm -hmm. you know, your learning and share it with other people because my, you know, my kind of our, my whole business model is about networked, becoming a network organization, not a hierarchy. Yeah. So many uh, charities and small organizations are still hierarchies where they think that if they, um, you know, they own the information that that makes them more powerful. And in fact, it doesn't, it makes us weak, you know, yeah. and life will topple over. So yeah. more networks, more networks. Yeah. It's, it's yeah. definitely something I need to get better at is, is documenting <laughs> what everything that, I mean, I document on a technical basis so that people can use it when it breaks or, mm change it in some way but I don't I don't do enough of like so this was the problem and this is what I did kind of thing yeah yeah more and more people are using, of course, video to um, document and talk about what they did. And I, I haven't yet done much of that except to do this kind of YouTube show. Um, show, but um, I have my doubts. You know, I, I like to I like the written word. I like to be able to you know work through a written uh, description of something and not just listen to something because I don't take it in that well. I'm a what do yeah. they call? There's different kind of learners out there, and I'm a, a visual reader learner. I don't. It's not hearing for me. It's not the way to learn. Yeah, I'm a, um, I'm a doer, so I'm mm. kinesthetic, so mm. I have to read and then do what they tell me to do in the reading. That's um. me as well, yeah. <laughs> mm. I remember learning about these things when I did the um, Train the Trainer um, course um, for Open Data at the Open Data Institute. Um, they did a five-day intensive, you know, trainer uh, course, and it was interesting to see all the different ways people learned and kind of how things changed over the week as you learn more about other people's learning learning styles. Have you um, ever analyzed your learning style, Swain? No, I just try and learn, try and find out what I need to know. There's not much theory behind it, I'm afraid. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so what, what um, coming back to your, your course, um, Bobby, what's your, have you got any future development plans? Or are you kind of just still progressing? Yeah, so I've got a, a call with, um, sharing the network um i've got a call with um one of my colleagues who's a a, a real data enthusiast and um, she works with in across the sector to to support kind of digital uh, data awareness and, and how to use data in a lot more detail than than i do um and she she's been looking at and talking about creating the course for a while so i just said why well, why don't i help you and we can put it into it can be written by you, but it can look like a be more digital. And we just, you know, we use thin across it and <laughs> make it work in that way. Um, but I've also been thinking about some, some kind of shorter courses as well. So ones that can be self-directed and are a little more step-by-step -step type. So I'm, I'm really, 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 really keen on getting as many charitable websites accessible as mm. possible and um, so I'm going to be doing a kind of the basics um one um to begin with um just talking about the kind of the very very basics and what that means when when someone says you haven't got alt text what that means and how you might go about putting that in um and and headers as well but I'm also really keen on on making sure that documents are accessible so yeah, I, yeah, I'm a bit of a stickler for, for making sure that everything's set up so that if there is someone that comes across the document that I've created, they can use it as best they can. Um, but it's it's all a learning curve for all of us. You know, there's mm. there's always ways that we can improve, and that's my latest mission. <laughs> mm. It's interesting about accessibility because I know in the public sector, Swain, there's a, there's standards, aren't there, that the public sector has to keep to. Are, I'm yes. not sure they're the same for the rest of the sector. What's the public sector standard, Swain? 
it's I, I I couldn't quote it. I, I just yes. know it's there, and we we have a number of steps we have to go through to make sure that we're uh, complying with the, the requirements of it. Sorry, Bobby. It's it's WCAG or the Web, Web Accessibility Con Accessibility Content Guidelines, and you've yes. got to have double A. Um, yes. And it's I think actually that the legislation has to is live, as in you have to be double A by the end of next week or mid next week. But I know that quite a lot of larger organisations and NGOs that could be seen as public sector um, are frantically trying to play catch up mm. um, mm. to reach. Um, you know, the, last year I was, I was working on a, a website for a charity that, that, had, um, that was for visually impaired people. And I tried to push for a new website redesign um, or at least a reshuffle of things. They were using WordPress and they were using a template that is in no way accessible. Um, so it doesn't use the, if you've got a keyboard navigator, so someone who needs to use a keyboard to navigate around the website, they couldn't because it didn't have in the right. code behind the scenes, the ability for that to happen. So when you're a charity for, people who can't see they're going to need that keyboard navigation because mm. it's going to tell them what's going on across the screen yeah. um and the response was but everyone who uses our website is someone doing it for someone that they support oh. and it, your head just goes into your hands at that point because you know that it will take them a while but they will eventually understand that if they made it more accessible then there would be <laughs> more people using it who who were visually impaired yeah. um, and being able to access the support straight away rather than having to rely on a friend. Yeah, because it's 2020 and, you know, we'd all like to think we're... Even more, the BBC have retired, does he take sugar? Yeah, yeah, indeed. Yes. So we for time we're coming swing? up to the, the end of our hour. Uh -huh. So um, just before we go, we ought to say that if you would like to take part in this show in future weeks, please do get in touch with us. Uh, the email address is Dr. Tech, that's doctor all spelt out, drtechshow at gmail.com. Normally during the show, we welcome phone calls if anybody wants to phone in and join us as well, but obviously this week is recording, so that doesn't work. And um, yes, thank you very much to Bobby for joining us. Thanks very much, Bobby. Um, and if people want to get in touch with you, what's the best way to do that? Um, the best way is to probably go to my website, which is Bobby, B-O-B-I, Robson, R-O-B-S-O-N, dot digital. And on there, you've got all the information about me, what I do on a kind of one-to-one -one basis and, and consultancy and projects, but also the learning as well that I'm doing. And are you on social media anywhere? I am on Twitter. Um, I'm und at underscore Be More Digital, um, which is the training, and at underscore Bobby Robson <laughs> for, for me as well. Great. Well, thanks very much for coming on, Bobby. Um, and hopefully we'll see you in future programs. Yes. Yeah. Thank you very much. Thanks. Thank you. And we'll hopefully see you next week uh, on Monday at 12. But for now, thank you.